Okay, so I'm going to be doing a talk that's uh, somewhat different to um, to Andrew's. Um, so, so the title of this talk is Learning by Creating. So I'm a GP. I work in uh, Fairfield at the general practice unit there uh, in Fairfield Hospital. Um, and I've been, um, I suppose, quite lucky in that I've been involved in quite a few different roles uh, in learning and teaching over the last um, five years or so. So um, at the moment we have GP registrars uh, at the unit, so I'm intimately involved uh, in their learning and teaching and training. Uh, previously I was a academic here, so teaching medical students, particularly in the Society and Health and Primary Care courses. And in my role in the hospital, I also have phase one uh, students as well. So these are uh, students who are still um, not quite yet jaded yet uh, with New South Wales Health and are excited to be in a clinical environment. And really at the very early stages of learning how to take uh, histories uh, and examination. And in my role at, uh, with my, my current role, uh, I'm really blessed, I think, in terms of what I can actually do with learning and teaching. I can spend quite a lot of time creating learning activities, thinking new ways, um, creative ways perhaps, um, to teach students and actually actually being, being paid for it. So without uh, further ado, the main theme today is to, um, to get everyone to think about the sort of um, teaching um, that, that you're able to do. It's, so often that uh, it's so rare, in fact, that students get to have one-on-one -on -one relationships with us. And I feel that sometimes we let some of those opportunities go in terms of what we're doing. So in terms of the structure of this talk, um, we'll talk a little bit about just theory initially, not too long, about Bloom's taxonomy. And then uh, three sort of three case examples, so three very different uh, learning activities I've been um, involved in that use this idea of creating as a form of um, enhancing student learning and also as supervisor development. Now, not all the examples are going to be appropriate for your own personal context. Hopefully, it will give you ideas on things which might, on how things might be different, how things perhaps could be um, more exciting for both yourself and for students. So, learning by creating. So that's Benjamin Bloom. Um, he was a educational psychologist who in the 1950s created his now uh, fairly famous uh, taxonomy. So this is a, this complex looking um, diagram was um, a revised version of it. And I bring this up just to show, um, because it's got some nice words on it, just what it's about. So, We'll look at mostly the cognitive um, process dimension and the idea is that there are certain learning outcomes, learning activities which are lower order type thinking. And then there are other types of learning activities, learning objectives which um, uh, are higher order. So they're more difficult but perhaps also engender um, better learning. And these are sort of the v verbs that you can see. So down the bottom, remember, so list, recognize, recall identify, higher order, so create, so things like generate, assemble, design, create. Now, I'm a lumper rather than a splitter, so uh, I prefer this version of the revised um, taxonomy. So remember, understand, apply, so these are sort of the lower order um, thinking, learning activities, or learning outcomes, these are the slightly higher ones. Now the reason I show this is to think about what we actually do when, when we interact with students one-on-one. -on -one. Again, this is a fairly rare, um, very precious resource, you know, one-on-one -on -one time that students have with their, with their supervisors. Now for the GPs in the room um, who take uh, students, sometimes we're busy. Um, that's just the nature of the game. We're running behind. We have to f see the next few patients the way we would normally just see them, just so that we can get back on track. So the student's going to sit there uh, potentially like a bit of furniture uh, for maybe the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes. And you know, as um, my experience, when you're doing that, you know, the students are sitting there politely, writing things away in a little notebook. Have any of you actually looked at 
what they write. Yes, John? Yep. What, what, what do they put down in their little notebook? I usually tell them what do I. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I might keep that, keep that idea on hold, but uh, has anyone actually looked at what they write in their little notebooks? Yes. Yes, I've seen it and actually I've noticed that it was a case which was mm -hmm. uh, a child with uh, RT, mm -hmm. so yeah. I noticed that it's not important for her, mm -hmm. but the case before was a case of uh, breast lump. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, she, and I told her, I need to talk to you further about mm -hmm. what we do with the investigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing the RT and I was doing mm -hmm. the scripts, uh, I looked and she was writing notes about what she mm -hmm. is going to ask mm -hmm. okay. in the okay. presentation. Right. So, so that's, that's a good thing for a student to be doing. When I look at the notebooks, um, and obviously what they write as individual student, very often they're writing things that they're going to look up later. So it might be the diagnosis, you might have mentioned the drug they hadn't heard of, they might be looking up um, you know, someone's un, um, in a condition that they haven't seen. And when we actually think about what they're doing, we could have just given them that list and they would have looked it up because that's what they're going to do anyway. They saw something, list of topics, list of items, they're going to look it up later. We could have just given them that list and saved them the, the, the you know, 30 minutes sitting in our rooms. And to me, that's a wasted opportunity. So they're sitting in the room, they're observing something, and what they, what they generated out of observing that interaction was a list of topics that we could have just given them um, at the beginning of the day or the beginning of term. Um, are there any surgeons in the room? I'm going to bag out surgeons for a little bit. No, excellent. So they're not here to uh, defend themselves. So one of the um, experiences I had as a, uh, as a medical student, and I'm sure we've all had similar sort of experience, assisting a surgeon um, in theatre. I, I quite like this surgeon. I respected him. And he, as part of the operation, it was a lap colleague, so it's really boring. Um, so he starts giving a bit of an anatomy type quiz. You know, what is this? What is that? What supplies X, Y, and Z? And then as part of that, you know, that process, the, the discussion turned towards uh, Cap, uh, Caput Medusi, and then it sort of took a sideward step. You know, who was Medusa? Who killed, who killed her? With what? Um, and I was quite smug because as one of my gen ed topics, uh, I did classical Greek mythologies. I knew all the answers, and the other student didn't. So I felt really, really proud. Um, but, but again, what is that activity? It's, it's asking a student to list things. It's so right down the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy. So remember a list of facts. And you know, sometimes you might ask, you know, this Caput Medusi, what causes that? What's the pathophysiology? Maybe we bump it up a little bit to understand. But still quite down the, still right down the bottom. And, you know, to be fair to surgeons, I think we often do that with students as well. So when students um, come in, they ask, they, um, they may have a, they may, we want to probe their knowledge in a particular area and we just ask them a list of questions, recite a list of facts. Perhaps we ask them, to, you know, again, pathophysiology, do they understand why X, Y, and Z occurs? Again, it's still pretty close down the bottom. Or when we're busy, the student or one of our registrars asks us a clinical question and we just give them the answer. I want to just give them the answer again. They'll remember that. Perhaps they might be able to apply it later. Who knows? But still, it's a lower order type um, learning outcome. So some of the potential things I try to do, so I'll go to create last, but in terms of trying to engender this slightly higher order thinking, is if I'm going to be very busy um, with the next few uh, patients, I won't be able to interact with the student too much. No, in terms of... Uh, in terms of something like uh, um, like apply, say, um, or even analyze, uh, I'm very uh, interested in adult mental health. So I might ask the students to do a mental state examination on the next patient who's coming in. Okay, so they have a specific task. Do the mental state examination. We'll talk about it later. But it's using their brain cells to apply something if they've done a bit of psychiatry already, actually analyzing the interaction. Or I might ask the student, for the next consultation, I want you to work out what the patient's agenda was, what my agendas were, 
and how did I insert it into the consultation? Okay. Analyzing the consultation. Evaluate. For the next consultation, I want you to rate how good was my communication with the patient and why. So how good was it and why was it good? And then to reflect on what that might mean for your own <coughs> practice. So again, getting the student to think a little bit higher up the scale. So that's Bloom. So let's go to the first um, of the three examples. Now, for these examples, I can't take all the credit for it. Uh, a lot of these activities um, were co-developed by um, colleagues in the school, so Joel, Winston, uh, Husner, uh, all at the uh, General Practice Unit, Andrew Knight and Ting. But, but I'll take the kudos, it's all right. So first one will be looking at some small group tutorials. Um, so that probably would be more relevant for some of the uh, medicine teachers or for the teachers who, who do tutorials uh, on campus. Looking at writing, resource creation um, for learners, and also um, some of the work we're doing now, the GP video observation, learning and teaching code co-creation, where the supervisor and the learner are creating together the learning activities. So small group learning. So, this is a tutorial that really um, was created and developed by Husna, who's sitting um, at the back. And she was um, kind enough to um, invite me to be one of the uh, tutors um, for this class. And I tested some, um, I suppose, the use of uh, some technology within the, within the tutorial itself. And got some interesting results. And uh, I found it, um, you know, I really like uh, computer technology, so I found it quite interesting. So how this tutorial works, firstly, there's a group of students, um, not too many. Um, they're divided into small groups within the tutorial. So this is a you know, one and a half hour, two hour tutorial. And within their small groups, they access a case, a, a pre-created um, uh, presentation on Google Docs, so that's kind of like PowerPoint, um, but it's on an online environment. And the tutorials, uh, the, the presentation just has a skeleton, and we'll, we'll have a look at, closer look at them later. So they work on, uh, work on the presentation. There's a, there's a few questions um, in the topic that they have to try to answer, then present to the rest of the class. They get about 45, 50 minutes to do that, and then, then they come back together, and each of the groups <coughs> presents the case, their answers to the rest of the class, answer questions, um, they bounce ideas off the um, off me, so the tutor in the class as well. So in the past, um, this uh, the groups tended to work together using uh, butcher's paper, but here we're asking them to actually create a um, an, um, a presentation, so PowerPoint-like presentation. So just so that you see what the um, what their students see at the beginning, so they they get um, a printed scenario, some questions they have to answer. And this is what the skeleton of the uh, presentation looks like on Google Docs. So there's just a few slides. Um, it's just white and black. Case summary, Lucy. So this, um, so this case looks at um, case of potential child sexual abuse. So these sort of questions, very simple. Basically, there's nothing, nothing in there. Um, just placeholders for the students to edit. And this is a real example. So this is the last time I've taught this class, um, what the students were able to come up with within about 40 minutes, 45, 50 minutes. So firstly, they completely changed the format. Um, you see there's quite a, few of ex quite a few extra slides that they've made. They get to flex their creativity a bit. One of the so if you, um, so in class, if they click present, presents onto the big screen. This is basically just you have a sense of what it looks like. And the students really get into it. They really get into it. And one of the clever things with the online tech is that more than one student can log in simultaneously. So they might split the um, this group into subgroups. Each of the subgroups works on part of the question. Just just to show that it's not a I think there's four questions, there's four cases, you know. Each of the groups did do the work. So this wasn't a cherry-picked example. This is an earlier session, so this is earlier in the year. Obviously a fairly uh, talented 
group that one in terms of uh, visual art. Some students are less visually <laughs> um, endowed than others. Second one is resource creation. So again, thinking um, further up um, Bloom's text taxonomy in terms of creating. So one of the things I really like my students to do, um, so in terms of learning a particular topic, uh, is if they can, as mentioned, teach that to somebody else, if they can communicate a fairly complicated medical issue to the general public, whether it's to the uh, patients themselves or uh, writing material that's to be digested by the general public, then they've probably learnt that topic quite well. So uh, let's say as an example, um, for if we wanted our students to learn about hypertension, blood pressure, if they could explain what hypertension or blood pressure was, to um, to a class uh, to um, to a group of community uh, community people, they've probably understood what it is that they um, what it is in that topic fairly well. Um, again, not I'm not saying that you have to do this, but these are just potential ideas to explore on what you can potentially do with learners actually within your clinical environment, especially for um, learners who are with you for a longer period of time. So. Um, for written and um, video resources, what I've gotten some of my registrars to do, so these obviously <laughs> registrars are with me for much longer periods of time, is to actually write for both uh, for GPs, so in GP publications, and also for the public. So this is in the conversation. So in last, um, so for the last um, 12 months or so, um, this, is a, this is a website, um, journalists run it, and I have a pre-existing account with them. And potentially, you know, students really do, or well, the registrars really did get a buzz out of um, writing uh, for, for this publication. So um, this is on the common cold about a year ago. Um, my registrars um, at that time spent some time you know, looking at some of the common treatments of cold, looking at the evidence for it, and then actually writing it and getting it published. So Sam <coughs> and Catherine. Uh, very good registrars, and one of the interesting things with this particular one was it actually got picked up by the New Zealand Herald and got republished in, um, in New Zealand. And for those registrars, you know, dealing with the common cold is obviously a very common thing in general practice. Um, surprising how often registrars actually don't do it that well. And here they were able to really learn the evidence behind it. My Registrar from about six months ago um, wrote something on what is blood pressure. And it was interesting as you know, he reflected on writing this, how difficult he found actually trying to communicate what blood pressure was in a language that would be uh, under, that could be understood uh, by, the, by the general public. And again, fairly significant um, you know, potential impact. You know, I don't see that many patients in a given year. Um, but potentially, you know, we can get our registrars to spread knowledge. And these are two examples. Think about um, getting the registrars or learners involved in writing practice newsletters, for example, writing material for writing material for um, the patients who attend the service. And for registrars, have also getting them to reflect on the interesting cases. They've seen. Again, not just reflecting and having a discussion with us, but actually doing a little bit more, um, writing about it and trying to get it um, published in GP media. So that's Catherine, again, about a very interesting case of a patient that we saw. Patrick, um, and some of the difficulties he had with managing warfarin uh, in a general practice context and for him to reflect deeply on what it was that he actually learnt from his experience. Um, moving that forward a little bit, some, so something like doing a spirometry, you know, we get our registrars to learn how to do that. Um, I never really get a sense present previously on how well they learnt the activity. You know, one way to really bolster their learning is to create 
a training video for subsequent registrars, so how to use the spirometer. So this is a little example of something he made. And to find it, if you want to look at the full thing, just Google GP unit spirometry, YouTube. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, today we'll be going through um, how to do a spirometry here at the GP unit. Um, we're currently in room two, um, consultation room two, and I'm just going to run through where the equipment is and how to use it. So the main bit of tubing has um, okay. a red and a blue tip. So I can guarantee they you how do you do spirometry go by the end of his term. Into the back um, of the spirometer doing is measuring your ability to Became very breathe good out. at telling so patients first how to do the spirometry. See your lips. <laughs> That's exactly okay right. to confirm. In terms of interpreting, and now we've done three pre-bronchodilator. We are going to administer some salbutamol uh, to our Explain to patients how to use a space device. deep breaths. Okay, in. That's the fourth and final path. To print, so number two, print. And that's... <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And... Part of the reason um, to do this is also so that, again, I don't have to train future registrars on the technique, and I wanted to learn how to do, um, use video as well, and so the very first video we actually created at GP unit um, was the most important. Well, hello, I'm going to teach you how to make coffee using the coffee machine on my bed. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the taste of New South Wales health, of course, is uh, international roast. So getting our students and registrars how to make a proper coffee Thanks, Patrick. So, right up the top of Bloom's taxonomy, so creation. So using creation as a learning tool. It doesn't mean that all the other things aren't important, but if there aren't, but it is a specific thing you want your um, registrar to learn well, just push them up the top. They don't know how to do something, a particular skill or a particular knowledge well, get them to create something as a project for that. Term. Or with a student, especially if the student is with us for a longer period of time, we want them to really know one topic well, you know, get them to create a, uh, a patient resource, a resource for future students who are going to be attached um, to the term. They will definitely learn that topic well. And there are all sorts of other benefits. Like my current registrar puts the spirometry video on screen as he's doing the spirometry so that the patient gets a sense on what's going to happen, how it's going to work. He gives out the link to a spirometry video for the patient who's going to come back for spirometry. So again, so that they know that they know what to know what to expect. The last one is so this is a, a project we're involved in at the moment um, using video observation and and a lot of the you know, equipment and techniques there is still under development and we've been developing this with the, both students and registrars at the GP unit. Uh, for about the last nine months or so now. And the idea behind this is you know, learning and supervising the techniques, we don't necessarily have to um, read them off a textbook or just learn from our peers. We can try creating something. We can just try something. That when we try something, get feedback from, from our learners, our students and registrars. How did that activity go? What could have made it better? What would you have liked to do? What would have liked to do differently in this activity? And then use that process um, iteratively to create something new, something, um, something fun. So in terms of the video observation, what we're doing, um, well, this was my initial conceptualization of it, was that I would have a video camera, so a streaming camera in one of our consultation rooms. I would observe. So, so um, observe the consultation, so a proxy for direct observation in the next room. Potentially I could record it uh, for, this, for the learner to review later and then get feedback on it. So that was the original idea. Um, so basically like that. Um, we created a bunch of resources you know, from feedback from, uh, from the registrars, from the other supervisors, from our patients. You know, did this make sense? Um, what would what would you like not to happen or to happen? 
Um, and so we've created a, um, just a little sheet, uh, information sheet for the patients that's, that's on the table. Um, this is, I've got to show some equipment and some of the things that we've been able to see. So initially, um, very low cost in terms of equipment. So old, uh, old smartphone, bulldog clip, lump of, uh, lump of um, blue tack. And to have the old smartphone wiped and just Skype installed and with a white list so that can only take call from a specific computer. And so this is what, what it looks like. So the camera's sitting up here. This is Quadrants. Your Yes. you know, um, Alan, my registrar, is on the other side of that camera. Uh -huh. Normally I'm observing him, but today yeah. he's observing me, just so that you can see how I, I run with things, so you can get a sense of um, how I practice. Okay. Now, at any stage, if you want a camera to be turned off, just let me know. No problems at all. Okay. Is that all right? Yes, that's fine. All right, so what can I do for you today? Okay, so initially the plan was me observing the learner, but we've started to do it the other way around as well, for the learner to be observing, observing me. And you know, sometimes we see something really interesting. So this is Patrick. Um, so thank you to this patient for giving his consent. Now, Sephora, I just wanted to tell you today, um, my boss is just looking at the consultation to so help give me some feedback. Is it okay? It's just on the camera. Is there? If you want me to turn off any time, you tell me, okay? Okay. Oh, Look at this man's ass. Nothing to hide. Mm. Sorry. Nothing to hide. Nothing to hide. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um. All right. What's brought you in today? This is after three days. Oh. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, better. Feeling better today? Yes. Yeah. I find this one actually my life is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, sorry, the report is uh, there somewhere. This is from last year. Thank you. Chuck it away. Yeah, so Patrick um, mentioned as part of his term that he hadn't done any uh, mental health to so psychiatry since medical school and so it was very uncomfortable with the idea of doing mental state examinations and so even though he had a sort of intuitive sense of what was going on with his patients, patients presenting with, um, with mental distress, emotional um, distress, it was very hard for him to understand what was happening and with this two series of videos in the first one of what we don't see is uh, that was a fairly long consultation and the patient revealed something quite important to him towards the end. And Patrick was thinking, well, you know, this, is this person really, does he have major depression? Is, you know, what's going on here? And it was very interesting for him to see the second video and sort of seeing the contrast. In his mind, he sort of understood that, well, he, yeah, he seemed like he was pretending better the second time. But it wasn't until we actually saw the two videos that he could actually start to articulate uh, in terms of the mental state examination. Oh yes, he's doing this here, you know, look at his face, look at his psychomotor. I mean, the first one, it was, you know, really, uh, was really still, and the second one, it was moving much more normally, his tone of voice. So as potentially as a, uh, as a tool for, um, for the learner to identify something in particular, so there's a particular thing that they want to do and for have to be recorded and then observed. Started doing this with uh, phase one students as well. So as I said, I do phase one tutorials. So these are students in the first two years of the program. Um, normally, we would have a group of um, seven or eight students wandering around the hospital wards, uh, asking patients where they would be happy to have a history or examination done on them. Of course, the difficulty is that um, one or two students will be 
politely doing the work with the patient while everyone's standing like a bit of a, bit of a statue, pretending to be polite. Um, and I'm not entirely clear how much learning they're getting, getting out of it. And so what I did was um, get some students to come to us. Um, so these are students of the, uh, of the practice who are happy to come to the hospital to see some students. Um, and for the two students either doing a history or examination, to have the full devoted time with the patient while everybody else was observing what was, going, what was going on. And then we were able to have a discussion, they could look up resources while they're actually observing the interaction. Just start whenever you feel. Yeah, ready? Okay. Okay, so, so um, my name's Alex. And yeah, I'm Sly. And uh, we're first year medical students, at, uh, second year, sorry, medical students at UNSW. Um, is it okay if we just ask you a few questions about your history? Yes, that's true. Yeah, and so I didn't catch a lot. So I had some totally gone away. Yeah, okay. Okay, and um, the one that comes up is just so here we're that. watching in the uh, in the main room. It's not um, it's not very good. Yeah, yeah, so I just want to say that um, I think you're doing a good job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to get started now. Um, so yeah, so the interaction is a little bit more relaxed than sort of the stilted environment at the bedside. Uh, I've, I've been a little bit scarred with doing um, tutorials on the bedside. So last year was the first time I did phase one tutorials. And on the very first one, and these are year one students, their very first clinical tutorial, one of my students fainted. Uh, unfortunately, he fainted um, while being observed by the nun, who then set off a metcore. Um, which was very exciting for, for all the other students, but for not that student who got, then got wheeled to the emergency department, feeling like a goose. Um, in the second tutorial, one of my students started wavering as well. I just, um, I'm just being facetious, but the, these two students didn't feel, when I asked them for a bit of feedback, quite as... Mm -hmm. oh, this, was the, this was the first 30 seconds. Because oh, I didn't want to actually reveal this patient's history. Yeah. So, um, so, so in, this was a shared history. So one student did about half, and the other one did half. That's, yeah. So they felt, I suppose, a little bit less pressured that they weren't surrounded by their peers. Um, they, you know, they knew they were being observed, of course, and they knew that I was observing them as well. But within the environment, it is actually just the three of them. The camera, interestingly, does get forgotten uh, by by the parties. Physical examination. Is that okay or is it higher? Well, what I would normally do, we just know playing with little taps on your chest, okay? So with the with the percussion, yeah. the idea is is that this hand is the rigid hand, and you'll need to develop a technique with the striking hand so that it's fairly loose. So mm -hmm. as if you're playing a piano, you have to strike. So, so you should be able to hear an audible note. Okay. This is the rigid hand, and you need to develop a technique with the strike hand the so that it's fairly loose. So as if you're playing the piano, you have to strike. So, so you should be able to hear an audible note. Okay. Okay. And it should be. Yeah, so, why do I hear it? Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. So, now with Richard, because he... So in terms of trying to you know, turn our students into humans, you know, when this around the bed, mm, 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 they uh, felt really proud that I was able to get one of the students to utter profanity at my, uh, at my, uh, at my percussion. And of course, um, low frequencies get picked up much better on the, on the uh, microphone. It sounds much louder than in real life. Right, so learning and teaching co-creation, so again, it's not the activity itself that matters, but the sort of concept that you can try new things. You know, I, as part of this, I learned how to um, develop my skills as a supervisor using a number of different techniques. So direct observation, different ways of doing direct observation, trying new tools, getting the students involved uh, as part of the project, you know, in terms of the direct observation, what works for you, what helps, what doesn't help, uh, what makes you feel 
that you're achieving something, what doesn't. Right? Getting them to actually being involved in part of the development of yourself as, as a supervisor while the students are learning. Um, they're they weren't learning what they have to learn. That's it. Thank you. Any questions?